Welcome to the Grieving with Gratitude podcast. I am so excited to have Nino on the Grieving with Gratitude podcast. We are going to talk about all things, how your narrative really takes an impact on your life. He is a spiritual life coach. He is a content creator. You probably have seen a lot of his videos because a lot of your videos have gone super viral. You have like millions and millions of views on your Instagram videos, which is so dope. That's how I found him. And then we started being friends on Instagram. He's also an actor, a poet. You just have all the things going for you. And I just love how authentic you are. That was like the thing that I loved about watching your videos is that you're just so authentic and real. So thank you for being on here. Ah, thank you so much. That's a very lovely and flattering introduction. Okay. So I wanted to really talk to you about just like get your background on everything because I know that you have your own courses that you're doing, your spiritual life coach, and then you are this massive content creator. So I just kind of wanted to pick apart like just because you're just so authentic. Like, how do you come from a place of just being vulnerable and authentic? Because I think that's like the thing that is really magnetizing to people. I think for me, anyways, the way that I come from a place of authenticity is by not thinking about authenticity. I I really believe that we get stuck in a lot of mental traps when we're considering how do I need to show up online? How do I need to, you know, be myself? And, And again, this is why a lot of my work and why I did choose the name Nino, which means boy, essentially, for myself is because I believe children are masters at being authentic. You don't need to ask a child to be a child. A child knows how to do that. But some, somewhere along the way, this is something Dr. Gabor Mate talks about, we begin leveraging our authenticity for acceptance. And we do this because, you know, when we're kids, it's more important to meet our attachment needs, aka to gain some sort of acceptance because we're babies, we're helpless, we need it. But at some point in our lives, I really believe that authenticity is a need. And I was really fortunate enough because I've experienced some early childhood trauma and some losses in my life and the grief that's held in the foundations of my life have served honestly as kind of like freedom as the catalyst for freedom because when you lose people very close to you to very violent and unfortunate ways suddenly like the weight of the world is off your shoulder because suddenly the true weight of life becomes apparent. I could die. I can die at any moment. I could die walking out. I could get hit by a car. I could have a heart attack, myocarditis. Who knows what I could die of suddenly. And and, in a weird way, as as, uh, somber as that sounds, it's actually a very stoic, uh, it's a stoic technique. And it gives me a kind of freedom where I just couldn't, I, I can't be bothered to not be myself because life is too short to live inauthentically. Yeah. And like, Obviously, I built this whole Grieving with Gratitude podcast around losing my dad and it like birthed my spiritual awakening and seeing that like I only really do have this present moment. So I have to live it as full and authentically and as real as possible. I went through like having a drug issue. So I literally had to like completely change my life because I was like every way I'm naturally doing things is really destructive. (laughs) So I literally had to reprogram my entire thinking pattern. But for you, what was that like? Because I know that you experienced loss really young. I mean, I'd lost like grandparents and stuff like when I was younger, but I didn't really come across as like, it wasn't really that impactful for me, I guess. It wasn't until my dad's death when I was like in my thirties that I was like, oh my gosh, this is huge. So what was that like for you? You know what? Yeah, I I relate to that. When I, my first grandparent I ever lost, you know, it was a natural death and you're young and, you know, death is kind of this kind of abstract concept and you're like, okay, they're dead. No problem. Um, It was when I was 13 that my grandmother took her life, Marisol, she killed herself and we were very, we were Catholic at the time and I began contemplating what that meant because for me I was, oh my God, she's going to hell as far as I've learned, suicide means you don't get to go to heaven and here I am conceptualizing this, this woman who was sweet and who stoked my imagination, a creative woman who, you know, had mental illness and suddenly she's going to hell and that was like really hard for me to grapple with. And then at 15 years old, my aunt was murdered in a really brutal and violent um, loss. So at very young ages, I was grappling with the concept of death beyond the kind of, oh, aging kills you and disease. And at the same time, I had begun using like smoking weed. By 15, I was taking Molly, like ecstasy. And I, and I kind of fell into an escapism route where I found that every time that I was dealing with pain, whether that was heartbreak or just grief, my pattern was 
I need to escape this because I don't feel comfortable sitting with my pain. And it was a lifestyle that, you know, I was very self-indulgent in, and a best friend that I had, Khalil, we live very parallel lives, both very athletic and competitive and hardworking, you know, doing very well in school. Yet at the same time, we have these like self-destructive tendencies. And when we were 21, he died of an overdose. And that was like, for me, I think like a very impactful moment because that is what I talked about earlier. That for me was totally the idea of, okay, this isn't just like old people. This isn't just your grandma who, you know, was sick and old. This isn't your aunt who, you know, hung around bad people or made poor decisions. This is your best friend who's living the exact same life as you. And look at what your lifestyle can do. This can kill you. Mm -hmm. And I realized I had been living like in complacency. I'd been living in fear of really stepping into who I was because in a weird way, it was more comfortable living in the ex in the perceived expectations of my parents, of culture, of society, of peers, because in a weird way, it's kind of this prison of, com of comfort where you're like, oh, I'm comfortable never putting myself out there. It's just a mask. It's just my ego. And his death served as like this permission to live freely as myself. Um, and, th and those were like, I think the the catalyst of grief. If I'm to expunge a little further, when I was 18, I had my like oh, spiritual awakening. Um, but the thing is, and this is something I'd like to always share is just because you've had a spiritual awakening doesn't mean you have it figured out. And I, I had to like grapple with that because, you know, here I am at 18 and like, wow, I finally realized the material world isn't the only thing out there. There is some nature beyond the material realm and, and I'm engaging with philosophy and, and I'm studying psychology and I'm practicing meditating. But th that wasn't enough for me. Like you, I was still engaged in unhe unhealthy habits. I was smoking weed constantly. I was drinking excessively. I was taking Molly. And it was like I was convincing myself that, oh, well, it's yin yang, baby. This is what balance is. You know, I meditate in the morning and then I get fucked up at night. Um, but that, that was also just my inability to sit with the work because the work really is grappling with your shadow, grappling with the, the inner work, you know, engaging in a relationship with your inner child that isn't just surface level. And that was all stuff that really took me probably until I was like in my early 20s to really start doing and cultivating and not unlike you, I see grief in my own life as one of the f most fucked up gifts I've ever gotten because it has served as the most transformative events in my life. Uh, and yeah, I'm really proudly like I don't drink. I don't use those kind of drugs. I'm I'm not sober, I guess, because I technically do smoke weed and I, I enjoy psychedelics. But it's for me, it's as sober as I've ever been. So, <laughs> hey, there's no judgment at all at, in that's like why I created higher conversations was like for the soberish community or people that are sober curious because I feel like there's such a stark line and like some things will serve you for a purpose in life, like, or a series or like a moment or a quarter. And then you'll be like, this doesn't serve me anymore. And it's okay to like have those moments of being able to ruminate between it. You know, for me, like getting sober was like the biggest thing. I mean, I still smoked weed when my dad died. Cause there was like, no way I was so anxious. Like I was so anxious the entire time. Cause he's my only parent. So like, I literally went from like, you know, a family of two to like just me. And I was like, Oh my God, this is, and he enabled me. Like I was like, did you not grow up with your mother? Mm -mm, not mm -hmm. really. She like never really, you know, she just was not a lady that really wanted to have kids, you know, and I always had that feeling. So I think that I know that she now as an adult looking back, I can go, she has mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so, and that, and I give her grace for that, but at the same time, we don't. you're still the child who had to endure the back end of that mental illness, unfortunately. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, you're living through it, but I was going to say, for smoking weed and all that stuff, like when you stopped doing drugs because after your friend died, do you think that, did you feel like, because this is for me, this is what I'm going to just say for my story. I knew that like over my dad's body, like went in the hospital, I was like, oh my God, I got to get my shit together. Like I was super heavy into drugs and alcohol, like cocaine mm -hmm. and alcohol were like my best friend. Um, and I was like, I have to completely change my life. Cause I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I knew, cause I went through rehab that anything I was feeling in that moment, if I numbed it out by doing something else, that feeling was going to hit me whenever I stopped and, and felt again. So mm -hmm. for you, you made a stop too. So like, what was it like for you? Did you get that? 
Mm. Cause you had to feel your stuff then. You know what? Uh, I've had a very nonlinear journey, let's say with drugs, sobriety and personal growth. When my friend died, I didn't immediately stop using drugs because I was just in shock. Like I, I was in absolute shock. I, I went, I remember going to his funeral. I, I literally couldn't speak. I was just heaving in tears. And that year I, I got fucked up for the first few months, just like benders on benders. And when I started to slow down, I was finding healthier, let's say general patterns in life. But honestly, I still lived a very like uh, hit and miss lifestyle, let's say. I would go like all the fall and spring and I would be sober-ish, you know, barely have a drink, maybe smoke weed here and there. The summer would roll around and then a festival and, you know, a big party. And then, then I would get blasted, take MDMA, whatever it was. And again, I was very able to rationalize this because I'd go, well, look at my life. Look at me. I'm so fit. I'm so, I meditate all the time. I do all these things that are, yes, good. But it was really to rationalize the fact that on some level, I was suppressing feelings of trauma while I was in university or just doing my work, just working, working, working. And then when summer rolls around where, you know, it slows down, well, now I can repress it, not with work, but with partying. It was only really this last summer, not this summer, but last year, where my cousin, unfortunately, uh, he shot himself in the head and he, he was like my older brother. Yeah. And that was heartbreaking. It was absolutely devastating. And that's when I really took a look at my life and I and was like, all right, man, he was a hardworking guy. He didn't do like drugs or anything in any excess, not unlike you, but we found out the last few weeks of his life, he definitely was doing some drugs, you know, Coke or whatever. And I just had to, I sat with myself one day and I came home drunk. And honestly, I had the darkest moment of my life where I finally understood what it would be like to want to kill yourself because I really wanted to in that pain, okay. sitting with the grief of my cousin, reflecting on my fuck ups. And I, and actually it was the most enlightening moment for me because suddenly I felt total compassion and relatability to my, to my grandma, to my best friend, to my cousin. And then I, I just knew, oh, that's what it is. We have an inability to sit with our pain. And if I continue to repress this one day, it will come back when I'm drunk in a stupor and I will actually take my own life. And I'm not willing to do that because I don't want to hurt my family. I don't want to hurt my friends I def and I don't want to hurt myself. And it was literally like the next week where I, I moved to Vancouver briefly with my family. I opened up about the struggle I was going to. I told them I wanted to be sober. Like I kind of just wanted to hold myself accountable. And I've been, and that's when I stopped. So I really only just stopped like committedly, like I'm not drinking, I'm not using those drugs, even recreationally, what, you know, no mas as of like January. Well, I mean, officially I'd say like January of 2023 and it's been really interesting to step into because in a lot of ways you asked about what it was like when the pain finally hit it was it was so sad it was so sad to see this kid i just saw this narrative this story within my own life of like wow he you have consistently pinned yourself as somebody who was alone who had to go through this pain alone and and you know there's some truth to that like you know when when my grandma took her life my family didn't talk about it, we, but then again, they didn't know how to. It wasn't like there was some malicious force in my family. It was just my dad just lost his mom. He didn't know what to say to us. We were kids. You know, when my aunt was murdered, that was my mom's sister. She was in shock. She didn't know how to talk about it. And me being, yes, a highly sensitive kid, I've always been this highly sensitive kid. I took it personal. I took it as I don't have anyone to talk to. Nobody understands my pain. And no, and I also, I indulged in the idea of nobody will ever understand my pain. So why not just ignore it? Why not just drink it away? Why not just, you know, not be with it? And, you know, of course, the always the irony in this lesson is it was sitting with it fully, showing up and owning the fact that I have an addiction or had a problem or have a problem that has created a lot more strength and resilience that has allowed the problem to not be a problem. I'd be honest, I've partied with people sober and they've done lines in front of me and it doesn't even phase me at all. And again, that's only because I finally took the time to sit with the thing that was leading to the addiction. 
And for me, it was really just shame and condemning like myself as a child for not being strong enough or for not, you know, not being tough. And now I'm really owning the fact that it, if anything, the fact that I'm sensitive is my superpower. That's like the thing that makes me the best artist, the best coach, the best human that I could ever hope to be. And yeah, that's kind of my, my shtick. <laughs> I love it. I mean, honestly, like going back, like this is something I had to realize with like my mom and my family as well, because when people would die, they just disappeared. And I was like, you can't, these people like matter. You can't, I'm like, and I'm hurting, but now like, you know, a couple of years in, like realizing people only operate from their highest level of consciousness and what their awareness is. So you can't be mad at people because they didn't give you what, because they're literally are operating at their highest level. So you can't be like, well, I need more from you. Like even with my mom, like the mental illness thing, like there was a lot of years I struggled with that where I was like, why can't she do that? It doesn't matter why she can't. It's just, she's operating from her highest level. Is it where mm -hmm. I think you should be? Probably not, but I'm creating hell on earth for me mm -hmm. being like, you should be better. You should have done this. It's like, all I can do is own my stuff. And what we both have experienced is like in those sudden like losses is a, it's a ton of trauma. And we create these, you know, narratives in our lives mm. that we then see out pictured everywhere. Like I'm always alone <laughs> or no one understands me. Well, and then you're like, why am I surrounded by all these people that have, don't understand me? It's <laughs> like, well, you're literally just, that's how your lens is. So that's all you're going to see. So like, <laughs> it's just so funny. Like, that people just want to push all this stuff aside and it's like, and normalize it, you know, like even during mm -hmm. the summer to go out and just get fucking hammered. That's normal for people, like normal for everyone. That's like what the summer is. Right. <laughs> and it's so counterintuitive to be like healthy and be like, no, I'm good with my own thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. We feel a cultural need to escape our reality. And again, I'm, I'm a huge cultural critic. I, I would point out many things around the alienation of, of our culture, the way it doesn't really serve our human needs. I think Dr. Gabor Mate's book, The Myth of Normal, it should be a must read for everybody. Uh, it really just highlights the fact that most what, of what we consider mental illness is just sensitive individuals responding appropriately to a toxic culture. Um, and, but there's something you said, and I really would love to talk about is like narratives and the power that those hold. Because honestly, where I am now in a place of genuine fucking love, and like, I feel I love my life. I feel like divinely guided. Even if things aren't perfect, I, I have this surrender to my discipline, to God, whatever it might be. And I realized in hindsight, a lot of the greatest moments of my suffering weren't even necessarily the actual objective events that occurred. And I'm not taking away from the pain. The pain sucked. You fucking experience grief. It's tough. But the true pain was the story, man. It really was the narrative. It's, it's the self-indulgent yes almost vain self you know flat like it's it's vanity in a weird way it's like indulging and in, in Eckhart Tolle calls it the emotional body you're feeding this part of you that becomes empowered in the pain and I remember it I remember being a teenager and walking around Ugh, I'm better than everybody because they've never experienced trauma like I have and and they would never be able to handle it like I've handled it or when I'm 21 ugh, these people think that these people posting about my friend dying, they weren't even his real friend. I'm his best friend and I'm dealing with that. And, or just, and those are the stories that truly cause pain. Cause like you said, you tell yourself, oh, nobody understands you. You will subconsciously end up in situations and around people who could never understand you. And it's just to reinforce, and in a weird way, it's, it's a form of control, right? We're seeking control in the chaos of our lives. And whether that's us seeking out self-sabotage because in self-sabotaging our relationships, there's a predictive chaos to it. Yet at the same time, it reinforces the narrative of, see, everything ends for me because I'm not good enough. I'm a fuck up and my life is a miserable chaos. It's like, yeah, because you're choosing self-destructive patterns and tendencies and behaviors and substances because they reinforce that story, which gives you a greater sense of control, reinforcing your ego, your sense of self, because you aren't really willing to change because you don't actually want an out again, which is, and this is why when it comes to narratives and the powers they hold, I think rock bottoms are fucking amazing. I love when I see people, and this is a little bit twisted. When I see people about to hit the rock bottom, I'm like, Oh, keep going, man, hit that thing. Hopefully, you know, without the 
the worst possible case. Yeah. But, but like, I say that because when you're complacently comfortable in this, in a, in a kind of semi misery, AKA doing what you kind of said, living for the weekend, chasing these ephemeral highs, see, seeking the, the highs and in, in getting drunk every weekend, that comfort in a way, especially because it's culturally conditioned, that doesn't motivate change. But a deep, dark moment where you really like look at your sense of self or the ego, what you've created, and you go, I don't like this person. Now, that is a moment that could breed the possibility of true change. In that moment, transformation is possible because you actually look at that ego and go, no, maybe this isn't me, like, or maybe this doesn't have to be me. And, and that, I think, is kind of like a perhaps one of the many potential antidotes to the narratives of pain is actually getting sick of it, you know, hitting a rock bottom and it mm -hmm. can be extremely beneficial. Oh, a hundred percent. Because like every time you relive that story, you re-energize it. Like look at gossip, you know, you just re-energize the same shit over and over and over again. You could be having a great happy day. And then you ta start talking about, you know, like you just re-energize the story in your own life. Like, mm -hmm re-energizing someone ghosting you or something if that you have an abandonment thing that's going on you know instead of just being like well, whatever they could be busy and just keep going on with your day the more you regurgitate it you know it validates your ego to be like yeah like that is what's happening but it's mm -hmm. ultimately we're able to create whatever we want and I do agree with like the whole rock bottom thing and I mean it is like breakdowns are literally the biggest opportunity for breakthroughs so like to not stand in people's way of it, you know, I feel like a lot of people want to control things. I'm like, that is a part of their journey. Like that's what they need to learn. And like, I wish that sometimes like that maybe people, I mean, it's all part of the journey, no matter what, but like hadn't stood in my, the way of my rock bottom so much, you know, because maybe I would have gotten here a little quicker, <laughs> but it's okay. I got here when I did, you know, but I mean, I really, the narrative definitely is so powerful. It makes such a big change in someone's life. So it was like the narrative, you had your like sports, like I'm good. Like I, you know, party sometimes, but like most of the time, like I meditate every day. So like it evened out. What it, would you say your narrative now in your life is? Oh man, my, to be honest, there's, there's two things. There's a spiritual ideal that is don't live with a narrative. Live so totally engaged with the present moment that your mind doesn't have to create a narrative. And in attuning my attention and my intentional actions to the present moment, I can show up as authentically me as I can. And that's what I try to do in my present moment. Whenever I'm engaged with people, when I'm doing a task, I try not to think about a narrative and let go of it. And in a weird way, that's great. Now, of course, at the end of the day, I'm still a human. My, my human tendency through evolution, evolutionary mm -hmm. processes is to create stories. And the story that I try to tell and the one that I kind of retell my clients and, and like, cause I, I do share parts of my life to kind of hopefully as to draw inspiration from is one of an alchemist that I am a trend, that I have the capacity to transmute pain. And that has been my role here. Now, of course I have to be mindful because if I indulge in that story too much, I might subconsciously start seeking out things that cause me pain just as an opportunity to transmute them. But I'm mindful about it. And at the same time, the truth is, I still have pain in my life. I still, that loss of my cousin, like his suicide was just last summer. I can't pretend that that doesn't hold pain. My best friend, as much as I have sat with that for years, I still, I still cry about that. You know, he still sits in the room with me in my meditation and I, and I talk to him. And, and as such, because pain is a part of my life, the story that I tell is of somebody who's trying to transmute pain into love and to, and to bear my naked soul to people and hopefully by bearing myself nakedly fully as imperfect as i am with a sense of humility reverence and comedy and humor because i love that I love making fun of myself as i love making fun of others and i love making fun because that's part of the fun is not indulging in my attachment to this impermanent life um yeah and I, and I try to do all this just to serve honestly as a mirror and also to feed myself because i enjoy it and, you know, hopefully in my own presentation, people might see something that they can draw from. And at the same time, I indulge my own, my own self, you know, because I, I have passions. I have passions for artistic expression, for helping people, for being of service. So kind of finding a way to 
identify the narrative that best serves my passions, my purpose, and my and my values. And for me, that's one of transmuting pain into love. Do you feel like when people are first start on their spiritual journey, because I feel like, you know, like there's so many things you have to like, almost like not redo, but you're like reprogramming yourself, yeah, right? Like to think differently and live differently. Do you feel like at the beginning of everyone's journey that the narrative, like you almost have to be conscious of what your narrative is mm. and like what you're creating? Does that make sense? Almost like when you're doing affirmations, like you're mm. affirming what you want to create and where you want to go, right? Because we're creating at all points in time. So that's, I, yeah. do you get what kind of what I'm saying? Oh. In the beginning, there's so much conditioning that we still have to let go of that. Yes, you, the most of the work is, it's psychological, to be honest. It's like, yeah, you have to reprogram the subconscious substructure of your mind. So you have to become intentional about the language that you use because language is the baseline sub software of the mind. So like you said, aff affirmations, mantras, simply becoming aware of the fact that you have thoughts, thoughts aren't you. You know, it's like you're still navigating things that are brand new. Um, and, and yeah, that should be like the focus. And again, I'm trying to be more careful and not projecting what I think should or shouldn't. I can speak from my own experience. When I first had my spiritual awakening, I was very, I've always been quite, quite intellectually minded. And that was both a good thing and a bad thing because it meant that the moment I had a spiritual sense of myself, I indulged in a lot of intellectual books and readings. And then I, I just described myself a new sense of identity. I didn't simply let go of ego. I just created a new ego. I'm better than everybody because I'm aware of the fact that I have an ego. But in doing that, I was being, I was, I'd become a victim to my own spiritual ego, which is a bitch because it convinces you that you don't have an ego. And that's the most pernicious kind of ego. Um, <laughs> and, and, that's why I love when people are like, I have no ego. I'm like, <laughs> God, they're the people with the biggest fucking egos. <laughs> and it really is. I, I always, I don't know if people will be able to see this or if it's just an audio, but I always say, this is what happens. You have a, a mind, a psyche, a spiritual awakening creates like a crack or a hole. And then things start coming out and new ideas start rushing in, but your psyche doesn't know how to handle it, especially your ego. And instead of what could happen ideally, which is the ego surrenders control, it exits and then spirit manifests totally and you become enlightened rarely happens to anyone in the first round what happens is your ego goes i need to be able to contain all of this so the ego inflates so it, it can now contain everything all right you want to okay spirit all this sure sure I'll, I'll get big enough to contain it all so now i'm a spiritual being and i'm and i'm and i have no ego whatever it is that the new ideas you've introduced into your psyche your ego will just expand to a point where it can contain them as opposed to what the work really is, which is challenging your ego consistently, c engaging in daily practices that remind you that you're not just your thoughts and emotions, and having the humility to know that you don't really get rid of your ego. At best, you become so aware of it and you become so healed that, it, that it's kind of like a, a familiar friend that you don't pay too much attention to, you don't take too seriously, but you know, you make sure that you're always kind of keep your eye on them because you don't want them to, you know, ruin your life. <laughs> yeah. Like I always think of my ego as like, I mean, your ego literally wants to protect you. It wants to keep you safe. That's all it's doing. So sometimes when it keeps you safe, like, like a helicopter parent, it means it keeps you <laughs> small, right? Yeah. It's almost the same thing. Like your ego just like wants to protect you at all costs with its limited knowledge, right? So if it feels unsure, it'll try to keep you safe, keep you small. And so I think when you have like the spiritual awakening, it's all these new ideas. So it does make sense where it's trying to contain all of it because it's like, okay, I got to keep you safe still. But if you can like lovingly look at your ego and not try to get rid of it and just be like, hey, I know you're there because like you really are looking out for my best interest, but you also don't have everything. Like you don't have all the knowledge. So mm -hmm. you can kind of give it, give yourself grace and give your ego grace. But like, yeah. yeah, what you mentioned, you're having a daily spiritual practice to kind of like reinforce, like, and yeah. kind of reconnect you. What's yours look like? Mine looks like a meditative practice, uh, sometimes breath work as well. Uh, but when I do both of them, it takes like an hour and a half and I don't always have an hour and a half in my mornings for a, a spiritual, or perhaps it's better yet. I don't always make time for an hour and a half, 
but every morning I do a minimum 30 minutes to 45 minutes of meditation. These days I practice Kriya yoga meditations. So they're just specific meditative techniques from the Kriya yoga lineage. But I began meditating eight years ago when I was 18, so I'm 26 now. I began meditating just using apps. I would just use Headspace. Then after a few years of that, I began using the Waking Up app by Sam Harris, which I would heavily recommend. It's incredible. It also has really great resources. And the reason I, I am a little bit, let's say, strict within my own life and how I conceptualize spirituality and why I do think at least you do need a practice is that I believe it's very easy to get wrapped up in your ego. And I believe it's very easy to tell yourself you're spiritual because you've read spiritual books and you like spiritual ideas. And that's great. I think that's amazing if we like those things. But if we're not consistently engaging our minds with a practice that reminds us that there is an awareness that is broader than the sense of who you are. And within that awareness, that is that contains everything that ever arises. As such, you are not simply the story you tell yourself. You are not the memories of past. You're not your expectations of the future. You are this broad awareness, what I call the divine source. You are, an, like the Bhagavad Gita says, an individuated unit of the divine. If you don't have a practice that consistently reminds you of this, I believe it's very easy to fall off the, the path. And for me, anyways, it's essential that I meditate every single day. And when I don't, because of whatever reason, it is extremely clear that I'm more emotionally reactive. I'm more easily irritable. I'm more easily pulled into unconscious behavior patterns. I'm more easily offended. Everything that's negative is exacerbated and everything that's positive is diminished. And I just recognize that now. So for me, meditation is like a, there, it's not something I debate. I have to do it. It's your non-negotiable. Non-negotiable. I love it. I like to do like do little tests on myself. I like to try new things by getting rid of things because I just it. like to test it. So I always have had like a very strong spiritual practice, but the last couple of months I was like, I'm just going to see what happens if I don't, if I stop reading these books or I stop doing stuff. Cause I just felt like at some point I was almost on like overload and I was just like, I'm just irritated by everyone. <laughs> so I was like, I'm going to stop doing all of this. And I let my little angry self come right out and like, anything I wanted to say, I just said it. And I was like, wow, this does not serve me. <laughs> How was that but I wanted to see, honestly, like it was, cause I felt like in the spiritual community, there are not that many funny people. <laughs> Your face. There's not a there's lot of people. Like, there's like zero, like no one thinks anything is fucking funny. Like no one laughs, I feel like. So I was like, you know, I'm kind of over this. So I dropped my daily spiritual practice mm. and I let myself be, I guess, how I would, a normal person would be. <laughs> so if someone irritated me, I would, I would say I would, I was waking up with violence. <laughs> I woke up today in violence. And so <laughs> I literally unleashed whatever I wanted on people. And I thought, okay, I want to see what this is like. Mm. And I was like, this doesn't serve me because I was literally perpetuating that story in my head. And so anyone that's listening to this, this is like, definitely if you're grieving currently, like that's how you feel is very mm -hmm. reactive. So I was just literally letting myself react to everything because when you meditate, you become less reactive because you become proactive. So if you're proactive, you're not reacting to things. You already, you know, anticipate that you're going to, you're fine and you're safe and you're at peace and it's, everything's good. So I let myself just be super reactive and I will have to say the daily spiritual practice came back. <laughs> let's let's, I want to talk about that. I think there's some nuance here. You said something important, which is that if you become indulgent in seeking spiritual matters as a form of escaping your reality, like indulging in books consistently, uh, meditating because like you can't deal with the world or whatever, or even like becoming a recluse, um, this like is almost becoming like addicted to this stuff. Does that make sense? It's Absolutely. like you just transferred your addiction to something else. Absolutely. And and this is what Chris Sartain, who was my breathwork instructor, uh, who taught me, and he's also in the Kriya Yoga lineage. He talks about the fact in one of his books that a lot of people, especially in the new world, who come to spiritual matters, really 
they seek out all the renunciate practices, yet they're not actual re renunciates. So in typical like yoga fashion, if you were a renunciate, well, you would renounce everything. You'd go in a mountain and, and sure, maybe that's the path for some, but there's like certain practices and ways of living, like, you know, always reading spiritual texts, meditating for hours, doing like going away from society. But now, nowadays, a lot of people seek out spiritual practices for renunciate purposes, but they live in a city, you know, they're escaping their reality through spiritual, you know, like through spiritual addiction. And it's no different. And I think that often you talked about humor, often people become forget the fact that you still have an individuated aspect of the divine within you. A lot of people believe that connecting with the divine means to relinquish all sense of your unique individual individuality. Of course, I understand that's a common reaction against the hyper individualism of the West in in favor of the collectivism from those Eastern cultures in which a lot of these practices originated. But it's a it's a mistake. It's a misstep because like the Bhagavad Gita says, you're not just part of the divine. You are uniquely a part of the divine. And within the Bhagavad Gita, it says the highest calling would be to you, for you, us to actualize our unique characteristics as an aspect of the divine. So for me, for instance, I love entertainment. I've loved movies since I was a kid. I've loved storytelling since I was a little kid. I've loved trying to be funny since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. These aren't like things that I was conditioned to. I was like this. I've always been extremely passionate and energetic. As such, the moment that I sensed in myself that spirituality was becoming like, oh, I can't make fun of things anymore. I always have to. I was like, that's repression, dude. You're repressing yourself because actually what's happening is a sense of control is arising. You want to control how you're perceived because it's great that you're doing these practices, but I had to recognize you want people now to perceive you only in your spiritual light because it's, let's say, more easily acceptable. But no, nah, man, you have a sense of humor. You, you have a kind of a twisted sense of humor. You like making fun of things. You like pointing things out. You like saying the uncomfortable. And that doesn't make you any less spiritual. If anything, denying these aspects of ourself, you know, you know, making our, denying our personality is not spiritual. It's repression. It's spiritual bypassing. And that is the very process that leads to what you mentioned earlier the kind of inflated egos that are so pernicious that convince themselves they're no longer present. And those people are just self have their heads up their own ass. Yeah. Cause I was like, dudes, and it's okay. Like I, our personality is what makes us authentic. Our personality in our humor is what makes you, you and how you interpret and see the world that makes you, you. Yes. We can create our own realities and, you know, create whatever we want into existence in our life. And like, what do we want our lives to look like? But like, that doesn't take away or negate who you are. That's why like, there's so many life coaches and like that people like your flavor. And if you had no flavor, then, you know, no one would come to you, right? And it's like, even chocolate and vanilla, most two popular ice cream flavors ever. A lot of people don't like chocolate or vanilla. So it's like, okay to be you. But it's like, it is funny within the spiritual community. There's so much it's easy to make fun of. And people get so serious about it. And it's okay. It's okay to be like, that's weird. Or like that, I don't, I don't vibe with that. Maybe in 10 years, you will. And that's a part of your path and your journey. And you're on it. And it's fine, but you don't have to drink all the Kool-Aid at once if you yeah. don't want. If you don't want to put a crystal in your yoni, you don't have to. Yeah, if you don't want to go microdose with a bunch of people that don't know anything about anything, you don't have to do that You don't either. have to. <laughs> and yeah, there's this, yeah. And again, and this is why I think Krishnamurti is such a great spiritual philosopher because he's he's very much, he's he says, deny everything. Deny your religion, deny your culture, deny your, your spirituality, deny anything that suggests that wants to define itself in a way because every time something is defined it becomes well a creation of humans and it becomes a conditioning and it becomes influenced by whoever the hell created it and there's such wisdom in that of course look systems can help programs can help religions and books can help but the wisdom that he's pointing out is that ultimately they all come from people and people are beautifully imperfect and mm -hmm. and and you know what i mean when when you try to prescribe to a specific way of living that isn't your specific way of living, you're only going to minimize yourself. And that's what I think true authenticity is. I, I am like, so I have a program called the Divine You Program. The whole philosophy about it is that 
I don't know what's best for you. Only you could ever know that. Oh my goodness, what a radical idea. But really, it's about taking, and again, there is work to do, of, of course, the, the difference between impulse and intuition, but the difference between who you think you are and your core values. But once you get to that point of recognizing the core aspects of who you are, you're going to realize who you are is not like other people. There's unique flavors to you. And either you live according to those ideals and to those values and you hold integrity above all else. And in doing that, what I promise is that you will feel divinely guided. Life fucking works out because it's you're living by your ideals and your values. And when you don't betray your core sense of self, that's when I say you're living in alignment with God. Because like I said, you are an individuated aspect of the divine. So when you live in alignment with that, you are living in alignment with the divine. It's only when we leverage who we think we, who we are for, like you said, oh, I need to be spiritual. I need to go to this specific thing and I need to do this specific thing because that's what the spiritual people in my community do. Oh my God, no. This is like, you, you've, you've strayed away. Uh, there's a guy called Roy Eugene Davis is part of the Kriya Yoga lineage. And somebody asked him, oh, you know, like, I'm struggling to find a spiritual community. What should I do? And he's like, count yourself lucky. He's like, you're lucky. You don't have to deal with other people's shit. Focus on your work. And, and I thought he was so, again, I'm paraphrasing, but there's so much wisdom in that and recognizing that, to be honest, you really shouldn't be paying too much attention to what the other spiritual people are doing because they're not you. Your path isn't theirs. And the more that we try to follow somebody else's path, the more likely it is that we're walking in the wrong direction. Well, and every aspect of life is spiritual. Like the trees are spiritual in essence because they are made from the divine, right? Like uh, ev ultimately everything is a reflection and mirror of who we are and how divine we are. So even like this gnat that is buzzing around my face that I am like, I want you to go away so bad. That is a reflection of the divine, you know? So like everything is spiritual. So you can't say that something isn't. Mm-hmm. You know, like even the grieving process that there's so much to be learned. And like, even in that, that's spiritual. And it's just so weird within our culture. Uh, and you're in Canada and I'm in the US, but like people don't talk about death and grieving. And like, that's why I created this podcast because it's like, there aren't things that you have to just push under the rug and not talk about. They're like things that you can really have amazing, like blessings out of something you would never consider a blessing right? Like you can be very blessed through it on the things that you learn after someone has passed away or whatever, even though it comes from something you would never want to have happen. Can I ask you what, what has been the biggest blessing that you've learned in grief? The biggest blessing I've learned in grief is that I can do whatever I want. I can create whatever I want. I can be whoever I want. You know, it doesn't, it's not contingent on what anyone thinks of me. It's not contingent on what society says I should be or what I should do, that I can literally do anything. I don't have to wait for anyone's permission to live life. That is the biggest thing because everything else stems from that. Man, I, th I think probably the, uh, probably echoing the same sentiment. And also I love how shamelessly I love the people that I love these days because I, I feel like more than most people, I'm like, you guys don't understand, man. This can be taken and this will be taken and it will all be taken and you're going to have to learn to let it go. And I, and in a weird way of the consistent, unfortunately tragic deaths in my life have allowed me to learn how to love unconditionally. Like when I, when I started seeing someone even, like I, let's say I was seeing this uh, woman briefly, right? And we only dated for a month and a half. But from the start, I told her, I was like, I have no expectation. Like, you know, I was very... I wasn't necessarily looking for a relationship, but I'm also not, I don't sleep around. So I was like, let's like, as far as I'm concerned, I'm exclusive to you. She's like, okay, whatever. Like you're intentional about where you yes. direct your energy. Yeah, exactly. And I was like, okay, great. And I'm happy because I'm at the point where I can write her poetry without any shame. I, I feel because I'm expressing myself authentically. I can, I can, you know, show up, make her dinner and do all these things like be of total service and love and, not feel any shame around it or like embarrassment and even though ultimately and and i was doing it all with and this is what i wanted to say is unconditionally like it's almost like all the loss has allowed me to move into a state where i can give my love 
without expecting anything back because at the end of the day in my brain that perhaps the trauma in there's well they could all die i'm not i'm not i'm not sitting around doing this because i need something back no mm-hmm. i'm loving because i'm loving and i want to love and no matter what happens no matter if this works out or doesn't and inevitably it didn't i didn't feel bitter about it because i i know how i showed up i showed up as myself i gave love selflessly i never tried to force my expectations of who i wanted them to be and that to me has been like a recent gift because i think the the other lesson perhaps i've held for a few years now the whole like yeah, live live do whatever the fuck i want but this one has been new like this truly like I'm going to give my love to people. I'm going to tell them I love them. I'm going to tell people what I like about them. I'm going to consistently show up in my life and try my best to be loving, even though this culture might find it like weird or people might be like, ooh, he's a bit much. Good. I get like, I love the fact that people have described me as too much because I think to myself, well, who are the greatest people on earth? Well, they were never too little, were they? No, no. Those people were a lot. Good then I'm on the path of being a great man because I am too much. I'm too much for, for mediocrity. I'm too much for average. I'm too much to live in a life constrained by, by shame and embarrassment around, oh, giving too much of myself. No, that's why I, I bear myself. That's why, you know, like I said, I would rather bear myself nakedly and get laughed at than repress myself and, and you know, in, in hopes of, of being safe. I love that. So you're literally embodying being a gift to others because a gift is giving something to someone without any a real gift is giving something to someone without any expectations back so if that person decides to throw your gift in the trash in front of you you would have no emotional attachment to it because it was a gift you're literally saying i'm giving this to you and you can do whatever you want with it and i have no attachments to it so I always tell people like yeah so your yes. life is literally a fucking gift now come wait i will say just to clarify I did call my mom after that woman ended things with me. And I said, mom, I gave someone my love wholeheartedly and they didn't want it. And she was like, good, fuck them. Like, she was like, like, she's like, like, you know, I told, she knew. And I was like, I'm very close to my mother. And she was like, you did everything. Like you showed up as you, you gave your love authentically and you were who you were. You you were even trying to be like generous and stuff. If somebody doesn't want that, it's really not your problem. And again, that's just to say, I'm still human. I still yeah. experience the pain of the loss. But to be quite frank, I didn't, like, there was no, like, post-breakup, I need to get hammered to deal with this. There's no, oh, no, I'm, woe is me. It was just, yeah, this hurts. I, I definitely sense the rejection. And then, you know, sitting with that, recognizing that they're really rejecting parts of themselves because, like, or or whatever. Also, I don't need to be everyone's cup of tea like you don't have to Mm -hmm. you don't have to get wrapped up in some self-indulgent narrative either where you're like i'm so amazing and everybody should like me no they not everyone is going to and that's okay Um, yeah and you're not like oh she's a bitch like she didn't like me you know like (laughs) you don't do that either so and honestly like when you live authentically like that you're never gonna be like i should have done more there's the shoulds never come back into your life like there's never been a moment there have been moments where I've compromised on things and I've taken them as lessons where I've been like, if I'm going to say I should have done this, well, then why the fuck didn't I? And then mm. I remember it. And the next time something like that happens, I'm like, no, I'm going to jump, not I'm going to run towards it because I don't ever want to regret not having showed up and done something for myself. You know, like you did the most you could. Cool. Your side of the street is fucking clean. That I guess that's also that's a lesson from grief, hey, because when you lose people close to you, you really are like, "Uh uh-uh, I'm not living life with a should have, that person could die, I'm gonna do everything with the, oh, well, I'd rather deal with, I mean, Russ, the rapper, he has a quote that's, I'd rather deal with, oh, well, than what if, and I, and I love it, it's so true. It is really true, they even, I mean, a lot of coaches have this practice of writing your obituary, which is kind of crazy every quarter, And you write your obituary and you read it every day of the things that, what would your obituary say about you? And how are you showing up in your life today, moving towards what that obituary says? So if you're like, he was on the cover of Forbes magazine. Okay. Well, (laughs) what are we doing today to get you on the cover of it? You know? So it's a really interesting perspective because I feel like people are like, oh, that's so morbid. 
But I don't really think it is because if you just look at it as like, what is it that you want to, who do you want to be? Like, what do you want to create? And like, even through my dad's death, I was like, I don't want to be this person that I've been for the last 30 something years. I want to be completely different. I want to be the person I never thought I could be. And then I just did all the things to get there. And like, I have a question then about that. Being the person then that you never thought you could be. And now that you're embodying that, what what was really the gap then for you? Like between being that person, like was it that that was more like you were unearthing who you were really were? What was that process like then? I think I had just lived in complacency. I mean, like we were saying before about your narrative. Your narrative yeah. is, well, I am just X, Y, and Z. So at the time, I am just a hairdresser who goes out and parties all the time and lives in Newport Beach, California. And is and I never, and I wish I could travel. I wish I could, you know, work out and get up in the morning and be productive or healthy. Um, it was like the list of wishes, mm -hmm. right? Of all the ways I wished I could show up in those ways. But my narrative was really that I'm just this like broke fucking hairdresser that never, you know, had no savings, like just drank every every day that you know like just was a mess and so when my dad died I was like I realized he didn't get to live I mean he died at 56 and was very oh, tragic really? so he was very young so I was like he didn't get to live life ever because he had me it was like 21 or 22 oh I mean he was like a baby when he had me and so I was like I want to do change my life then because like this is very short I I got it like, I have to figure this out. So whatever my natural, this is like how, because I would, did not have a spiritual awakening until like months after this. I just knew I had to completely change my life because I was like, no one is going to throw me back in rehab. So, and I won't <laughs> pay for it. I don't have any money. So <laughs> this is not happening for me. So I was like every, so I literally, if I had something that I wanted to do, I just like would sit back and like, I just became conscious and aware of my decisions and in my thoughts. So I guess that was my spiritual awakening. First step was that was just being conscious of my thoughts. Okay. I'm sad. I want to numb this out and I want to, you know, go drink or, you know, sit in my bed and I'd be like, do the complete opposite of that. And it'd be like, go for a walk. <laughs> so I literally just started reprogramming my brain that way. Like, what do I want to do? Eat a whole cake. Okay. Instead, I'm going to go for a walk. I'll go to the gym. I'll call a friend. You know what I mean? It was like literal things like to really just be like, I have to make my thinking completely the opposite because I was so reactive and I was really, really self-destructive. Mm. So that's literally how I just kind of changed my life. And then I started going to, you know, following more spiritual people because in that point people were like, you should go do like, I mean, people know you're grieving. So they're like, here, uh, here's a self-care event or they're just like, go to all these things. Here's breath work. Here's meditation. Here's a sound bath, like all the things. So I just started going to them all. It's and good. some of the things I vibed with, some of them, I was like, this is fucking weird. I don't want to do it. And then, you know, years later I'd go back and be like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> that was like me with ecstatic dancing. I think the first time I ever saw it, I was like, I can't do this. I was like, this is too weird for me. I think the first ecstatic dance I went to, I was I left early, took like two shots and I slammed a beer like across the way and then I ran back to the event because I was like, I can't do this sober. Just because it was, <laughs> so it was so weird to me. But now, you know, I'm like, oh, I like it. I see the intention. You know, it's not about it's not actually like dance dancing. It's like moving your body ecstatically. I can I can jab with that, no problem. Uh but yeah, I definitely understand that not everything in the cultural space of spirituality is always gonna, you know, resonate with each person. Yeah, and sometimes your self-care practice, maybe just getting, being intentional, getting a massage once a week for yourself and setting a time, that time for yourself, like an hour and a half of just, this is for me, this is my non-negotiable. So mm. I always like tell my clients, like don't do the most. Like I wasn't trying to do the most. I was just trying to, if you're trying to do the most in anything you're doing, like you're gonna get overwhelmed and be like, I don't this <laughs> like mm. so just do yeah. one small change yeah, that's a huge thing make it like make it sustainable <laughs> yeah make your life sustainable i know it's your podcast but you mentioned the obituary thing and i guess i'm curious to know whether like if you had to like make it real brief what would you want your obituary to say 
So over the years, it's definitely changed because I think through, you know, like you go through so many different spiritual teachers or listen to so many podcasts and you kind of like almost like a sea urchin. You like, you know how sea urchins are sticky. So yeah. they start off purple and then they're covered in fucking different shells and chunks of things. So I feel like that's kind of like what spirituality was for me, where I was starting to glom on to things and picking them up and they weren't necessarily mine. So at one point I was like, I want to be on the cover of Forbes magazine. Why? Like, or I want to have my own reality TV show. Why? Like, it was like all these like weird things where I was like, that those are all like very ego driven items. And now looking at really what it is, I, my social media number is not anything that would ever be on my fucking obituary. So if it's take it, it's things like that, where it's like, why is this taking a valuable real estate in my own mind? So mm -hmm. I was like, that's not valuable. What I want is like that I was able to travel the world and I was able to speak at all these events and was able to help people just by sharing my story and being able to be vulnerable. That is like my obituary. Like I got to see the world, like awesome. And I got to make great money doing it and help people. Hell yeah. Yeah, simple. But it wasn't all the accolades, you know, like, I don't need to win a Nobel Peace Prize. If I do, that's cool, I guess. But like, I don't. <laughs> I love the expect. I love. I love the burden we place on our shoulders. I gotta win a fucking Nobel Peace Prize. I gotta write. I gotta be on time. I <laughs> yeah, I gotta be have a New York Times bestseller. You know, <laughs> like I don't need to do all. I mean, if it happens, like it's yeah. not that I'm not able to. Awesome, but will my life and me thinking that I was a success be contingent on it no no I yeah. think at any moment where I'm at I'm doing good and I'm cool with where I'm at and on my journey right what would you be on yours he loved and you're like I do on <laughs> you're like I do no, on the Forbes magazine <laughs> no 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 he, I, I I if like on my actual obituary it'd be like he loved and he tried his best to tell the truth something like that just easy like I love it yeah because because at the same time look I have a passion for like i i really looked up to people who were cultural critics growing up i love george carlin i love what russell brand is doing on youtube i love people who are able to look at culture and society and critically dismantle it using their lens whether that's a psychological lens whether that's a spiritual lens whether that's a comedic lens and beyond the work i do one-on-one -on -one with people coaching beyond the content i make there's like, I feel compelled to be a part of a cultural conversation that helps people see what I see, which is that this society has not been designed for your best interest, that this world is, is very obviously, in my humble opinion, very obviously benefiting a small minority of people who, who benefit from keeping us divided, who benefit from projecting these, uh, these dogmas and ideologies surrounding race, gender, class that divide us instead of us recognizing that they are the true, you know, people who we should be in critically dismantling these corporate lobbying powers, these people with immense amount, amount of media power who want you to feel like the person who voted for Trump is a racist piece of crap, who want you to believe that the person who wants trans to people to have rights is a crazy liberal nut job. There are people who are benefiting off of the narratives that divide us. And I want people to recognize that our fight is not against one another. Our fight is against the, the, the system that benefits from keeping us divided. And that's something that I would love to be represented on my obituary, that he was somebody who stood for the unity of us against the tyranny of tyrants yeah and i honestly even think like even saying it's so it's fucked up because it's like even saying like unity you get in a vision of like what that person looks like you know and they're like got puka shells on or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> you know and you're, it's I like mean, but i believe it all like yeah. it is like we're all we are all literally a reflection of the divine every single one of us even the people that are manipulating their power to you know create division mm. it, they still have our divine too they just uh, haven't realized what their divinity is and i just if we all knew how much power we each had like think how, about how amazing the world would look like literally like what gandhi said be the change you wish to see in the world easy amen and i honestly starts with I, us i think you and i well, at least I can speak for me. I think we're trying our best to do that and to be that. Yeah. And just be authentic. And if you think things are weird, think they're weird, but like, look at your narrative, like always look at the narrative. 
because mm-hmm. everyone's got a narrative playing out and and even like within like social injustice there's a narrative that is being played out and not getting too consumed by it but looking at how do I feel about it and how can I do something about it you know mm-hmm. like even within grief everyone processes grief differently and our parents are going to process like we could you know like your parents are processing grief differently than you are over the same law <laughs> and there's no judgment over it right because everyone's going to experience it a different way and do their own thing with it so it's okay we're all just living our own little lives yeah i agree with that so where can everyone find you everyone can find me i'm on instagram at l divine nino e-l-d-i-v-i-n-e-n-i-n-o El Divine Nino. I also have a podcast called Where's the Nuance, where I try to bring a little bit of color to seemingly black and white topics to try to dismantle ideologies that create dogma to introduce a little bit of nuance and broaden our awareness. Um, I have a coaching program called the Divine You Coaching Program. It's a 10-week program. There's more information on my Instagram. You guys can always message me to ask more questions. And yeah, I, yeah, I'm online. I'm trying to be as active as I can on there. And yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I love it. I'm going to link all the stuff in the show notes. Thank you so much for this conversation. I want to just respect your time because we ran over a little bit, but thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. Have a great day. It was so nice meeting you officially and namaste. <laughs> namaste, baby. Bye. Bye.